The Cross and Its Shadow by Stephen N. Haskell Narrated by Timothy Turner Chapter 15 The Offering of the First Fruits When the waving fields of golden grain proclaimed that the time of harvest had come, the service of offering the first fruits before the Lord was performed in the temple. As the children of Israel journeyed toward Jerusalem to attend the Passover, on every side could be seen fields of yellow barley, the heads heavy with ripened grain, bending in the breeze. But not a sickle could be put into the grain, or even kernels gathered to be eaten, until the first fruits had been presented before the Lord. The offering of first fruits came on the third day of the Passover feast, the fourteenth day of the month Abib, or Nisan, the Passover was eaten. The fifteenth day was the Sabbath, and upon the sixteenth day, or as the Bible states it, on the morrow after the Sabbath, the first fruits were waved before the Lord. It was a beautiful service. The priest, clad in his sacred robes, with a handful of yellow heads of ripened grain, entered the temple. The glow of burnished gold from walls and furniture blended with the tents of the golden heads of grain. The priest paused in front of the golden altar and waved the grain before the Lord. Those first heads were a pledge of the bountiful harvest to be gathered, and the waving indicated thanksgiving and praise to the Lord of the harvest. The waving of the first fruits was the principal service of the day, but a lamb was also offered as a burnt offering. No portion of the first fruits were ever burned in the fire for they were a type of resurrected beings clad in immortality, never more subject to death or decay. For centuries God had met with His people in the temple and accepted their offerings of praise and thanksgiving. But a change came. When Christ died on Calvary and the veil of the temple was rent asunder, the virtue of the temple service came to an end. The Jews slew their paschal lambs as formerly, but the service was only a mockery. For that year, upon the fourteenth day of the month, Abib, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. The Jews kept the empty form of the Sabbath on the day following the Passover, but it was the rest experienced by Jesus and his followers that was accepted of God. On the sixteenth day of the month, in the year the Savior died, the Jews in the temple the Jews in the temple God had forsaken went through the empty form of offering the heads of grain, while Christ, the antitype, arose from the dead and became the firstfruits of them that slept. Type had met antitype. Every field of ripened grain gathered into the garner is but a reminder of the great final harvest when the Lord of the harvest, with his band of angel reapers, will come to gather the spiritual harvest of the world. Just as the first handful of grain was a pledge of the coming harvest, so the resurrection of Christ was a pledge of the resurrection of the righteous. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. The priest did not enter the temple with only one head of grain. He waved a handful before the Lord. Neither did Jesus come forth from the grave alone. For many bodies of the saints who slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection. While the Jews were preparing to perform the empty service of the offering of firstfruits in the temple, and the Roman soldiers were telling the people that the disciples had stolen the body of Jesus, these resurrected saints went through the streets of the city proclaiming that Christ had indeed risen. It is a sad fact that even the disciples who loved their Lord were so blinded that they could not recognize the fact that the time had come for the appearance of the great antitype of the service that they had yearly celebrated all their lives. And even when they listened to the announcement of His resurrection, it seemed to them as an idle tale, and they believed it not. But God never lacks for agents. When living human beings are dumb, he awakens sleeping saints to perform his appointed work. 
in the type, the grain was waved in the temple, and to fulfill the antitype, Christ must present himself and the company who had risen with him before God in the first apartment of the heavenly temple. In the early morning of the resurrection day, when Jesus appeared to Mary, she fell at his feet to worship him. But Jesus said to her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father, and your Father, and to my God, and your God. In these words, Jesus notified his followers of the great event to take place in heaven, hoping that on earth there might be an answering chord to the wonderful rejoicing in heaven. But just as they had slept in the garden on the night of Christ's agony and failed to give him their sympathy, so now, blinded by unbelief, they failed to share the joy of the Savior's great triumph. Later on the same day Jesus appeared to his followers and allowed them to hold him by the feet and worship him, showing that in the meantime he had ascended to his Father. Paul tells us that when Christ ascended up on high, he led a multitude of captives. In speaking of them in Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30, he tells how this company of resurrected saints who came forth from their graves with Christ were chosen. They were predestinated, then called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. This was done that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. This company was composed of individuals chosen from every age, from that of Adam down to the time of Christ. They were no longer subject to death, but ascended with Christ as trophies of his power to awaken all that sleep in their graves. As the handful of grain in the typical service was a pledge of the coming harvest, so these saints were a pledge of the innumerable company that Christ will awaken from the dust of the earth when he comes the second time as King of kings and Lord of lords. Little did the inhabitants of earth dream of the wonderful antitypical offering of firstfruits that was being celebrated in the heavenly temple at the time the Jews were carrying out the empty forms in the temple on earth. That was a wonderful congregation in the heavenly courts. All the hosts of heaven and representatives from the unfallen worlds were assembled to greet the mighty conqueror as he returned from the most terrible war ever waged and the greatest victory ever won. Earthly battles that simply gained dominion over a small portion of the earth for a brief span of years are as nothing compared with the war that raged between Christ and Satan here upon this earth. Christ returned to heaven, bearing the scars of that terrible struggle in the prints of the nails in his hands and feet and the wound in his side. Words fail to describe the scene as the heavenly host with one accord fall prostrate at his feet in adoration. But he waves them back. He bids them wait. Jesus has entered heaven as the firstborn among many brethren, and he will not receive the worship of the angels until the Father has accepted the firstfruits of the harvest to be gathered from the world he has died to redeem. He pleads before the Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. He does not plead in vain. The great antitype of the service celebrated for centuries is fully met. The Father accepts the firstfruits as a pledge that all the redeemed hosts will be received by him. Then the decree goes forth, Let all the angels of God worship him. We wonder how Christ could ever leave the glories of heaven to return to the earth where he had met only ignominy and reproach. But marvelous is the power of love. His sorrowing followers on earth were so dear to his heart that the worship of all heaven could not keep him from them, and he returned to comfort and cheer their hearts. The first three days of the Passover feast typified wonderful events in the work of our Savior. The first day typified his broken body and shed blood, 
and the day before the type met antitype, Christ gathered his disciples together and instituted the touching memorial service of the Lord's Supper to commemorate his death and suffering until he comes a second time. Every weekly Sabbath of the Lord is a memorial of that Sabbath on which Jesus rested in the tomb after he had finished his work on earth for the redemption of a lost race. God has not left his church without a memorial of the great antitype of the offering of the first fruits. He has given them baptism to commemorate this glorious event. As Christ was laid in the tomb, so the candidate for baptism is laid in the watery grave. We are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. As the first fruits of the resurrection, taken to heaven by Christ, were a pledge of the final resurrection, so, rising from the watery grave of baptism, is a pledge of the resurrection to the faithful child of God. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. The Cross and its Shadow By Stephen N. Haskell Narrated by Timothy Turner Chapter 16 Pentecost Pentecost, so called because it was held fifty days after the waving of firstfruits, was the last of the annual feasts held in the first half of the year. This feast was called the Feast of Weeks, on account of seven weeks intervening between it and the Passover feast. It was also called the Feast of Harvest, as it came at the close of the harvest. The Feast of Weeks was one of the three principal annual feasts, when all men of Israel were required to appear before the Lord in Jerusalem. As the children of Israel journeyed toward Jerusalem to attend this feast, on all sides could be seen the stubble from which had been gathered the ripened grain that lay all ready to be trodden out upon the threshing floors. At the time of the Passover feast, there was uncertainty in regard to the coming harvest, as drought or storm might blight it before it was gathered. But now there was no uncertainty. The fruit of the harvest was in their possession to be used for their pleasure and the advancement of the work of the Lord. And none were to appear before the Lord empty. They were not simply to bring a few heads of grain, as in the springtime, but they were to bring a free will offering according as the Lord had blessed them. This feast was sometimes called the day of the first fruits, because the children of Israel were expected to make liberal offerings to the Lord at this time. It was a season of great rejoicing for the entire family in which the Levites and the poor and afflicted were to join. The services of the Feast of Weeks, or Pentecost, occupied but one day. Many offerings were presented at the temple, among them two loaves of leavened bread, which were waved before the Lord. The Feast of Weeks was observed as an annual Sabbath and was a holy convocation. When Christ ascended from the earth, he bade his disciples teach all nations. They were to carry the gospel to the entire world. The disciples saw only a mere handful of believers as the result of Christ's three years of toil and sacrifice. But when Pentecost had fully come, or in other words, when the seed which the Son of God himself had sown during those three and a half years of weary toil had sprung up, then came the harvest. The disciples were ignorant of the results of the Savior's life, work, and sacrifice upon the minds of the people. In explaining to them the parable of the tares and the wheat, Christ had said, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. But they comprehended it not. As the Savior went from city to hamlet, he was constantly sowing the good seed. The harvest of souls gathered from this seed was to be presented at the antitypical feast of harvest. For centuries the children of Israel had celebrated this feast. 
bringing offerings from their harvest of grain. Of each one God had said, At the feast of harvest thou shalt present the firstfruits of thy labors, which thou hast sown in the field. The antitype came when the Son of Man presented the firstfruits of his labor, which he had sown in the field. There was a work for the disciples to do, in order that they might be ready for the great antitypical feast of harvest. They needed to study the scriptures, to put aside every difference, and become of one accord, that they might receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which would enable them to know how to care for the great harvest of three thousand souls that was awaiting them as the result of the Savior's ministry. They also needed this special outpouring of the Spirit to prepare them to carry forward the wonderful work begun on the day of Pentecost, until every creature under heaven should hear the glad news of salvation. In Palestine there was an early rain and a latter rain, which came in time to ripen the harvest. The prophet Joel, in speaking of the work of God in the last days, uses the term former and latter rain to represent the outpouring of God's Spirit, and in the following words he gives the assurance that in the closing work of the gospel in the earth, God will again pour out his Spirit. He hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain, and the floors shall be full of wheat. This great harvest of souls at the antitypical feast of harvest was only a beginning of the greater harvest that will be gathered before the end of the world. In the type, the children of Israel brought liberal offerings to the Lord at the feast of harvest. Those who entered into the spirit of the antitypical feast of harvest, or Pentecost, sold their possessions and goods, and gave the proceeds to help in carrying forward the work of the Lord. These offerings enabled the disciples to extend the work rapidly so that within about thirty-four years they could say that every creature under heaven had heard the gospel. Those who enter into the spirit of the latter rain will, like the early disciples, lay all upon the altar to be used by the Lord in the great closing work. As the seed sown by the Son of Man during his earthly ministry brought a harvest of souls at Pentecost, or the early rain, so the good seed sown by Christ's ambassadors, who faithfully scattered the printed page filled with the gospel message, and by voice and life teach the saving truth, will yield a bountiful harvest in the time of the latter rain, when God's Spirit is poured out upon all flesh. Then will be gathered the fruit of what each one has sown in the field. He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully, is the divine promise. The Perfect Sacrifice A Poem by Isaac Watts Lord, we are vile and full of sin. We are born unholy and unclean, sprung from the man whose guilty fall corrupts his race and taints us all. Behold, we fall before thy face. Our only refuge is thy grace. No outward forms can make us clean. The leprosy lies deep within. Nor bleeding bird, nor bleeding beast, nor hyssop branch, nor earthly priest, nor running brook, nor flood, nor sea, can wash the dismal stain away. Jesus, thy blood, thy blood alone, hath power sufficient to atone. Thy blood can make us white as snow. No other tide can cleanse us so. The Cross and Its Shadow by Stephen N. Haskell Narrated by Timothy Turner Chapter 17 The Sin Offering In none of the types was the individual worshiper brought into so close touch with the sanctuary service as in the sin offering. There is no part of religious worship that brings the individual worshiper into such close touch with the Lord as when he kneels at the Savior's feet, confessing his sins and knowing the strength of the promise. If we confess our sins, 
He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It is then that the repentant sinner touches the hem of the Master's garment and receives his healing power in the soul. Sin is the transgression of the law of God. The one who had done somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord was guilty of sin, and in order to be free from sin, he must bring an offering that by seeing the innocent victim die for his sins, he might more fully comprehend how the innocent Lamb of God could offer his life for the sins of the world. If the sinner was a priest, filling that holy office where the influence of his wrong course would cause others to stumble, then he was to bring a bullock, an expensive animal, as a sin offering. But if he was one of the common people, he could bring a kid or a lamb. The value of the animal to be offered was determined by the position held by the transgressor. The sin offering was brought into the court of the sanctuary, to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. The sinner, with his hands laid upon the head of the lamb, confessed over it all his sins, and then with his own hand he killed it. Sometimes the blood was taken into the first apartment of the sanctuary by the officiating priest, who dipped his finger in the blood and sprinkled it before the Lord. The horns of the golden altar, the altar of incense, were also touched with the blood. The priest then came out into the court and poured all the blood at the base of the altar of burnt offering. The bodies of the animals, whose blood was taken into the sanctuary, were burned without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. The sinner, by confessing his sins over the Lamb, in type and shadow, transferred them to the Lamb. The life of the Lamb was then taken instead of the life of the sinner, typifying the death of the Lamb of God, who would offer his life for the sins of the world. The blood of the animal was powerless to remove sin, but by shedding its blood, the penitent revealed his faith in the divine offering of the Son of God. Every sin offering was to be without blemish, thus typifying the perfect sacrifice of the Savior. In some offerings the blood was not taken into the sanctuary, but in every sin offering all the blood was poured out at the base of the altar of burnt offering in the court. When the blood was not taken into the first apartment of the sanctuary, a portion of the flesh of the sin offering was eaten by the priest in the holy place. As the priest assimilated the flesh of the sin offering, and it thus became a part of his own body, and as he performed the work of the sanctuary, he strikingly typified how Christ bare our sins in his own body on the tree, and then entered the heavenly sanctuary with that same body to appear in the presence of God for us. The priest ate only the flesh of the sin offering when the blood was not taken within the sanctuary. The command in regard to this was very plain. No sin offering, whereof any of the blood is brought into the tabernacle of the congregation to reconcile withal in the holy place, shall be eaten, it shall be burnt with fire. To violate this command would ignore the significance of the type. The priest entering into the sanctuary to present the blood of the sin offering before the Lord was a forcible symbol of Christ, who by his own blood entered into the heavenly sanctuary, having obtained eternal redemption for us. By the blood and by the flesh, the confessed sins of the sinner were in type transferred to the sanctuary. They were hid from view, for no human eyes, except the eyes of those who officiated as priests, gazed within the sanctuary. The type was beautiful, but how much more beautiful the antitype when the sinner lays his sins on Christ, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Those sins are hidden, covered by the blood of Christ. They are all recorded in the books in heaven, but the blood of the Savior covers them, and if he who sinned is faithful to God, they will never be revealed. 
but will finally be destroyed in the fires of the last day. The most wonderful part is that God himself says he will cast them behind his back and will not remember them. Why need anyone carry the burden of sins when we have such a merciful Savior waiting to receive them? In every sin offering, two things were essential on the part of the sinner. First, to realize his own sinfulness before God and to prize pardon sufficiently to make a sacrifice to obtain it. Second, to see by faith beyond his offering the Son of God through whom he is to receive his pardon. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. The blood of Christ alone can atone for sin. After the blood was presented before the Lord, there was yet an important work for the sinner to perform. With his own hands he was to remove all the fat from the different organs of the animal offered as a sin offering and give it to the priest, who burned it upon the brazen altar. At first thought this might seem a strange ceremony, but when we remember that fat represented sin, we see that it is a fitting ceremony. It was evidently viewing this service in the sanctuary that saved David from backsliding. He had beheld the prosperity of the wicked and was envious of them until his steps had well nigh slipped. But when he went into the sanctuary, then he understood the end of the wicked. We can imagine him watching the sinner, separating the fat, and the priest placing it upon the great altar, and presently nothing remained but ashes. In it he saw ashes only as the final end of all who would not separate from sin. For if the sin was a part of themselves, then when the sin, then when the sin was burned, they would be burned with it. The only reason God will ever destroy a sinner is because the sinner keeps sin in his own character and will not separate from it. This was an impressive type. The priest waiting for the sinner to separate the fat from the offering, ready to take it as soon as it was offered to him. So Christ, our great high priest, is waiting for each sinner to confess his sins and give them to him. Then he in return can clothe the sinner with his own robe of righteousness and consume his sins in the fires of the last day. Paul evidently refers to this part of the sanctuary service in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. The burning of the fat was a sweet savor unto the Lord. There are few odors more disagreeable than that of burning fat, and yet it is a sweet savor to the Lord, for it typified the sin consumed and the sinner saved. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but he delights in the destruction of sin separated from the sinner. When the redeemed of the Lord, from within the shelter of the new Jerusalem, behold the fires of the last day, consuming all the sins they have committed, it will be indeed a sweet savor to them. An individual who was too poor to offer a lamb for a sin offering could bring two pigeons, and if he was so poor that he did not possess two pigeons, then he could catch two of the wild turtle doves and offer them for a sin offering. But if he was too feeble to capture the wild doves, the Lord made provision that he should be allowed to bring a small portion of fine flour. And the priest would present the crushed grain as a type of the broken body of the Savior. Of this one it was said, His sin shall be forgiven him, just the same as the one that was able to bring a bullock. The handful of flour burned corresponded to the burning of the fat in type of the final destruction of sin, and the remainder was eaten by the priest, thus typifying Christ's bearing the sins. In every sin offering where animals or birds were offered, the blood was all poured out at the base of the altar of burnt offering in the court of the sanctuary. When we remember how particular the Lord was, that everything about the camp should be kept in a sanitary condition, we can see at a glance that it must have required much labor to keep the court clean. Therefore the Lord would not have directed that all the blood be poured on the ground at the base of the altar, 
if it had not contained a very important lesson. The first sin ever committed in the earth affected the earth as well as the sinner. The Lord said to Adam, Cursed is the ground for thy sake. When the first murder was committed, the Lord said to Cain, Now art thou cursed from the earth. He also said that from that time the earth would not always yield her increase. There would be failure of crops and barrenness. The curse of sin rests heavier and heavier upon the earth. There is only one thing in all the universe of God that can remove this curse. The land cannot be cleansed of the blood that is shed therein, but by the blood of him that shed it. It must be one of humanity, of the same family that shed the blood. For that reason Christ partook of humanity, became our elder brother, that he might remove the curse of sin from the earth as well as from the sinner. By his death upon Calvary, Christ purchased the earth, thus redeeming it as well as its inhabitants. Since it is the sins of mankind that defile the earth, in every sin offering, after the offering had been made for the sinner, the remainder of the blood was poured out on the ground at the base of the brazen altar in the court, as a type of the precious blood of Christ, which would remove every taint of sin from this earth and clothe it in Eden beauty.